Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiecka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiecka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiecka. With massive upheaval, pandemics, political unrest, and climate change, it's easy to either stick our head in the sand or just give up in despair. Is there a third option? What other choices do we have? Mission Evolution Radio TV show is coming to you around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. With us this hour to help find hope for our world is an old friend of Mission Evolution, Dr. Jude Curvin. Dr. Kirvin is a cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist, and author of award-winning The Cosmic Hologram and The Story of Gaia. Previously one of the most senior international businesswomen based in the UK and co-founder of Whole World View, she has experienced lifelong multidimensional realities, holds a PhD in archaeology, and a master's degree in physics from Oxford University, specializing in cosmology and quantum physics. Her work integrates leading-edge science and universal wisdom teachings, aiming to uh, serve the evolution of consciousness. Her website, wholeworld-view.org. Jude, thanks so much for joining us once again on Mission Evolution. Gwilda, it's always a pleasure to join you. We have such fun together, don't we? And even when times are difficult and the challenges are great, we still find somehow a way through. So I'm hoping that that's what we'll explore today. I I think that's a really good thing to explore at this point, right? Yeah. (laughs) So Jude, it would appear to be a real mess out there. What on earth is going on? Oh, my Lord. Um, Well, many different things I would suggest and on many different levels. But at the most foundational level, with all the challenges in these turbulent times, I would suggest that we frame this as the potential birthing of a new age. That we've come to an end of a long journey and we can talk about that and why we've got to where we've got to. But I would suggest that we're at a moment now where our collective choice, this is our moment of choice. Do we stay primarily with a worldview that's been based on materialism and separation? Or do we come together? And you know, we now have the evidence of leading edge science across all scales of existence and many fields of research that's converging with universal wisdom teachings to reveal that instead of a world and instead of reality and instead of a universe that's devoid of meaning and purpose and made up of separate stuff, instead we're finding that we're actually part of a universe that is living, meaningfully existing, purposefully evolving and unified in its wholeness where we matter where we have meaning and purpose so we're at this point that we can stay in that worldview that we've really followed the last few hundred years which is a very lonely worldview it's a very individual worldview but it's individual in that sense of a loneliness or we can wake up to remember that we're inseparable you know from each other and the world as a whole, that is, I think, our choice. That, I think, is our opportunity. It seems like right now um, everything is de- going the other direction. Uh, people are getting more and more polarized, more and more judgmental, more and more shut down, uh, more and more negative and violent in a lot of ways. How can this be leading to unification? <laughs> Well, some while ago, I think it was 25 years ago, a wonderful spiritual teacher called Wayne Teasdale um, came up with, coined a new word, interspirituality. And he wrote a book, and a, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Kurt Johnson, wrote a book called The Coming into Spiritual Age. And the perspective was that a time would come where despite the turmoil, the turbulence, the polarization, the challenges, this is 25 years ago, don't forget, would be some so great that we would be in an existential crisis, a meta crisis. And that's where we're at now. And the understanding was that despite that, 
on an underlying basis, on a universally conscious basis, there would be some guidance, some opportunity for us to wake up. I've just contributed a chapter to an anniversary book on spirituality. And what I've said in it is I think that it's not despite things are so challenging, but because they're so challenging. When we go back through history, the Renaissance came out of wars. It came out of um, pandemics. We found that the League of Nations came out of the First World War. We found that the United Nations and so many global cooperative efforts came out of the Second World War. I think we're at a much more profound threshold as a species than we've ever been. I and it's not to, yeah, because of that we cannot go on as we are, that perhaps this is the time to wake up and choose differently. It, we have seen echoes of this, but has it ever been as severe? Not as a global species. I mean, there are times when we look back through history, there have been times in prehistory where the environment has been going through major change. As, uh, uh, and when we were still, you know, homonyms, when we were still you know, humans per se, but early humans, a lot of volcanism, a lot of climate change. Um, and that probably did spur us to innovation. But now we've, we've come together. We know we're a planetary community. We know that we're a human family. We know that, and we have the tools. This is, this is the crazy thing. We have the tools to transform our world. What we don't have is a communal worldview of wholeness, of unity. And that's what I'm sharing. And that's what the evidence is now revealing and supporting us in making these different changes. And isn't that what the um, ancient spiritualism, okay, and the ancient teachings and the ancient mysteries, isn't that what they've all pointed towards, every, the base of every religion? Yes, absolutely. You know, when you trace back through all the religions at their most foundational, all of them, all of them have some form of what we call the golden rule in them. In other words, to treat others as you would wish to be treated. And there's a silver rule. Do you know there's a silver rule as well as no. a golden rule? Oh, oh no, not that's new I. To me. <laughs> I know it was new to me a few years ago. But um, the silver rule is treat others as you you understand they would wish to be treated, mm. which almost oh, puts nice. puts you in that wonderful Native American tradition of walking in others' moccasins <laughs> to understand, you know, to understand them rather than say, "I'd like to be treated like this," mm -hmm. so I'll treat you like this, which is great. But if I can perhaps go even a step further than that and say everything that you've told me, you've told me you would like to be treated like this. I would love to treat you as you've explained to me you would like to be treated. And that involves us listening to each other and learning from each other. It involves a certain level of empathy, too, doesn't it, that has been glaringly absent for quite some time. Well, you know, if you if you go with the mainstream media, yes. But, you know, I speak and you, I know, speak to many, many, many thousands of folks around the world. And in many cases, although we both agree and, of course, things are very challenging, there's kindness everywhere. There's empathy everywhere. And I loved what was said at the beginning about humankind, because kind is a type of but its other definition is, of course, compassion and empathy and generosity of heart. Perhaps we need to be humankind. As simple as that. But when we are in a worldview and therefore a mindset and where we look at the world through the lens of separation, we make the choices that we've been making and they're natural choices. What I'm sharing, what the evidence is showing and what, you, as you say, universal spiritual and wisdom teachings have always said is that truly we are interdependent members of the vast communities of life of our universe of its web of life and its life goes far beyond biological organisms to the whole of creation i, I would have to ask or point out isn't there a difference between truly em embracing and coming from an empathetic, kind heart and painting it on because it's what you want to be. And how can we move from one to the other? I love that painting it on. <laughs> such a, I had such a visual when you said that. 
Well, you know, there's a, there's a, a very long-standing self-help guidance that fake it till you make it. <laughs> I, I've never been a fan, I have to say. Um, but I do appreciate that in certain instances that can be the case. What I would perhaps suggest otherwise, kindness is and love are the actual the most simplest of things we could do. Empathy is perhaps what we can invite ourselves to do, and, and it starts with us, as, as we know, is make our choices consciously to make our choices from love. As simple as that, rather than say something unkind to someone, whether it's a family member, a friend, a stranger, say something kind. I love going, I love when I see people looking a bit unhappy in the world. You know, there's a lady behind a, a counter that I was buying something from the other day. And she really looked miserable, really looked miserable, as though the world was on her shoulders. And it may well have been. But she had the most incredible shoes. <laughs> and I said, I love your shoes. And she suddenly perked up and said, oh, thank you. I got them here and I, I love wearing them. And we had a lovely five minute encounter. Well, speaking of walking in another person's market, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, it is that magic moment, though, Jude. We have to take a commercial break. Jude and I will return very shortly, so don't you dare go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Are you interested in evolving with the times and becoming all you can be? Don't you wish there was one place to find the latest information to help guide you through the process? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio TV. Join me on my mission to find the latest evolutionary knowledge and tools. The guests on Mission Evolution are leading experts in a wide variety of divergent topics including allopathic, holistic, and integrative medicine, epigenetics, enlightenment, quantum physics, meditative practices, environmental issues, spiritual evolution, trauma healing, and so much more. Mission Evolution Radio TV is aired worldwide through the Exxon Broadcast Network, Exxon TV Channel 32 on Simul TV. You can enjoy our archives of radio or TV shows with our compliments at www.missionevolution.org. Come see the amazing lineup of guests and topics. With more than 200 episodes to choose from, you're sure to find what you're looking for. Visit www.missionevolution.org. What do universal wisdom teachings have to do with science? With us this hour discussing the nature of the universe is the author of The Cosmic Hologram and The Story of Gaia, Dr. Jude Curvin. Dr. Jude, what do the wisdom teachings have to do with science? Well, what I would suggest, Gwilda, is that wisdom teachings tend to, to actually cluster around three ways of, of discovering wisdom. One is the way of the mind, which I call the way of the sage, one is the way of the heart, the way of the shaman, and the other way is the way of the, the mystic, the way of the will, the way of the purpose, the way of the seer. So when I've, I've, I've researched, studied, and learned from wisdom keepers from many, many traditions over many, many years, but those three ways of knowing offer different ways into, different lenses into what is all, you know, universal wisdom but from different perspectives. So the way the sage, for example, which we find in ancient Greece or ancient, um, or ancient um, Egypt, for example, is the way of, of sacred science, is the way of understanding that the foundations of reality are number and sacred geometry and music. Yeah, but they're, they're very much in that sense of understanding. The way of the shaman is very experiential. It's the way of the heart. It's the way of experiencing 
the world as a web of life where everything is interdependent with everything else. And the way of the seer is often the unexpected, I didn't ask for this, but here it is, revelation of, of multidimensional realms of reality. So when we look at, for example, ancient India and the Vedic traditions, they tend to merge the sage and the seer in a realization that, you know, mind and consciousness aren't something we have, they're what we and the whole world are. When we look at the ancient geometers of, of Greece, their wisdom is being discovered now thanks to computers and the ability to analyze vast amounts of information to show that the world and the appearance of reality is indeed patterned geometrically. So it scales up and it scales down. So these universal wisdom teachings all have something to teach us. And we're in an amazing opportunity and moment now where we have access to all of them. So if we if we triangulate <laughs> from the <laughs> yes. uh, and bring them all together, what do we end up with? A fight or something else? We end up with our way to revolutionary understanding today. For me, this is our conscious revolution where we can interweave the way of the seer, the way of the shaman and the way of the sage. And when we do that, we're really bringing our minds, our hearts and our purpose together. We're literally integrating. And some folks will, will just be called to the way of the shaman. Others, the, the meditative and, um, you know, all the, the sort of super normal phenomena that is the way of the seer. And others will want to understand how this all works together. And I would suggest that all three now, it's really important that we co-weave all three together. As is, part there, of is there evolution? Is there there's a surface understanding of these things? There's these mm -hmm. rituals that people fight over, and, <laughs> okay, <laughs> to nauseam. Um, but is there a way? Don't we need to go deeper uh, into each one in order to bring forth what it offers to bring into the triangle? Yes, but we don't all have to go that deep in all of them, in my experience. So, you know, I've been journeying for all my life on all three, but it was a long while before I, I really entered into the initiatory journey of the shaman. I was, I was in my head from very early on, and I loved science, and I loved, and I walked between worlds. So I was always having, I was also having the experiences of a seer from four years old. So I naturally journeyed along those paths of a seer and a, and a sage, but it was a long time before my heart opened to the wonder of our beloved planetary home and, you know, Gaia and, and our, our, you know, the interdependent web of life of our whole universe. That really, for me, was the most revelatory because it really embodied that gratitude of a living, loving evolutionary universe within my life. Does, is that kind of universally, at least in our cultures, yours and mine, we're not that different. Um, is that sometimes or often the most challenging is, is the way of the shaman, the heart? I think it is. For I think those of us in the West, those of us that, I mean, I would say we're all indigenous. We're all indigenous. But those communities that we tend to describe as indigenous have been our wisdom keepers for this understanding when we in the West have lost so much of that connection through our worldview and through that paradigm I mentioned earlier of materialism and separation. They've held for, for us as a, as a whole, for literally for humankind as a whole, and now their voices are being valued again. We're learning from them. And they would always say that they learn from the whole world. They learn from the web of life of which we are an interdependent part. The, um, um, a lot of the indigenous um, prophecies, mm. uh, and I'm going to butcher the saying of this, but it's kind of a conglomeration of all of the ones I've heard, yeah. basically said that there was a time when, when the, the wisdom was cast to the four corners of the earth. And creator said that only when you come back together will truth be known. Is that kind of what we're looking at here at this time in, in the world? 
I feel it is. And and the, the indigenous voices that are coming now very much to the forefront of bringing these prophecies are all saying that exactly, that it is time for us to come together, all colours, all ethnicities, all communities to come together because we each have gifts to bring. Yeah, we're all human, but we each have gifts to bring from those journeys to this point. And there is a, a, a prophecy of when the eagle and the condor would come together, the north and the south of the Americas, but also the hummingbird and the quetzal. So there's some wonderful initiatives of the wisdom keepers of the indigenous communities now really stepping in as elder brothers and sisters for us to invite us into this remembering of wholeness. What I really find fascinating is when, when you look at um, um, comparative mythology, all different um, races and, and traditions are pointing to now. Yeah. Um, and have you found that as well? And what do you think of that? Very much so. Um, I mean, whether it's the, you know, whether it's the Mayan prophecies, whether it's the astrology of now. I mean, we're in an extraordinary uh, period um, of astrology. Uh, Pluto's just moved into Aquarius. We've had the most incredible solar eclipse with all sorts of astrological connections. We've just come through a, a Jupiter conjunct Uranus. We're moving into a time over this next year and a half where all the outer planets are changing signs. So this is like, the, you know, this is the turning of an era from that astrological perspective. And it's coincident. It is synchronous, of course, with the uh, with the prophecies. But it's, it goes back Will, to what you were asking. You know, what do we choose? Because this truly is our moment of choice. We can't go on as we have, or if we do, that, in my view, will be the demise of the potential that we have to evolve as a species. It seems like historically our choices have been personal ones. And now you're telling me that we have a collective choice that's going to make or break a lot of things. Why do you think the collective choice at this point versus just individual choice? Because we can't transform the world as we need to just on an individual choice level. We have to change it. We have to support that change at all levels from you know our personal self, of course, but the, the, the expanding of this, this beautiful circle of compassion, as Einstein called it, to the me and the, the all. So at Whole World View, we talk about act local, feel global and think cosmic mm. because it takes all of us to link up and lift up together. And it certainly takes a critical mass of us to wake up to this understanding and act on that realization that we truly are inseparable from the whole world. We, um, it's we're at, at about out of time in this segment, but it's so tempting to look at what's come before and find fault. Okay. The world is a mess. We've done all these bad things. Da, 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 da. But is that really the case or would we be here without it? I know we've got to go to a break. So I'd like to come back with a response to that. But I'd, I like to see meaning and purpose in every step we take, however challenging it may be and how apparently mistaken it has been. I don't think it has been mistaken. I think it's got us to this point as it needs to have got us to this point, but it can take us no further with that perspective. So I certainly don't want to be in the blame and the shame game, but I do feel that our journey has involved a lot of trauma that we now need to heal and release for us to be free to move forward together and to literally step into this amazing opportunity for our conscious revolution. So were we in a different place energetically as astrologically that led to what we've experienced in the past and now that is shifting versus we were screwing it up before and now we have a chance to make it right? Well, yeah, I mean, we, if we go back 2,000 years, two, two and a half thousand years, it's what's often being called the axial or the beginning of the axial age. And in astrological terms, it would be seen as the age of Pisces. But, you know, that axial age brought through some incredible thought leaders across the world, whether it was Lao Tzu in China, whether it was Buddha in India, um, whether it was Jesus in the Middle East, and, and, and many other, you know, traditions, the Judaic traditions, the Islamic tradition, all of those came through as various waves that moved humanity's thinking on. Mm. 
-hmm. and experiencing on. Well, it is that magic moment for our station, Greg. <laughs> Jude and I will be right back to continue our discussion. So you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Is the Earth sentient? What about the universe? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us discussing consciousness is Dr. Jude Curvin. Her website, wholeworld-view.org. Jude, that is a question, isn't it? Is is We think of the Earth as a, a rock floating around in space oft times, but there is a sentiency here somewhere. Could you go into that for us? Well, I don't want to be rude, Wilder, but um, someone has said you can own, you can't be half pregnant. <laughs> either, <laughs> either guy is sentient or she's not. Um, universal wisdom teachings would say, yes, she is. In fact, the word Gaia is the name of the ancient Greek goddess of the earth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, universal wisdom teachings in the main perceive reality as being innately sentient and going back to to what we we're saying about the vedic traditions of ancient india that you know mind and consciousness aren't what we have but literally what we in the whole world are and our our paradigm our our, our scientific paradigm our secular paradigm because it's more than science we have a worldview that is essentially the 19th century science of a mechanistic and separate material universe without meaning and purpose. But that mechanistic paradigm came through in its height as a result of, as a precursor to, along with the Industrial Revolution. So everything that came through the Industrial Revolution with its hierarchies and its um, inequalities and its exploitation was founded on a mechanistic worldview. That worldview has stayed all through the 20th century scientific revolutions of quantum physics and relativity theory. They were put the philosophical implications of those that we are not separate, that mind and consciousness is foundational, were pushed to the side. And instead, throughout the whole of the 20th century, Despite evidence to the contrary, that mechanistic worldview continued. And so the technological advances came forward, but the understanding of who we really are was just pushed to the side. And that kept us in that individuation. It kept us in the separation, all that we've spoken to. Now, leading edge science, the evidence is so strong to the point that the 2022 Nobel Prize for Physics was given to research showing that our universe is, exists and evolves in its entirety as a non-locally unified, unitive entity that is mindful and therefore sentient. So we're now at this point where the science is so compelling and it's converging with wisdom, universal wisdom teachings, so that we're at this point where, yes, we can say yes, not just because our heart says yes, but the evidence on all scales says yes, that our planetary home is sentient and a sentient being in a sentient universe. Is the, wasn't the mechanistic approach, didn't it make it easier to be heartless? Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, I, I don't think we can ever be heartless, but it, it sort of subjugated our hearts. It sort of gave prominence to our minds. 
And of course, it was very successful. I mean, when we think of the the the, the sort of the, the the several hundred years from medieval times in the in Europe, you know, medieval times in Europe was was absolutely dominated by the authority of the the Catholic Church. There was no willingness you know you're a heretic if you want to try and understand a little bit more about the nature of the world you're a heretic it's very dangerous so there was a whole journey to that point in the mid 19th century where science had separated from any perspective of spirituality because it was too dangerous not to but it got us at that point where then it was able scientifically to underpin a technological revolution that was the industrial age and all that's come since. I'm not blaming or shaming. It's brought us to where we are. And that, it seems to me, that sense of self is also really important because we go back to medieval times and we didn't have that sense of individuality. We had the sense of a deeper community, but it was pretty miserable for many folks. We've now come almost to the limit, it seems to me, we stretched our individuality as far as it can go. And now, but from that place, we can take a next step to come from that sense of diversity and uniqueness and gifts and come together. Well, isn't that the way of the world? Expansion and contraction. Everything grows that way. It so does. you say you say that meaningful information is fundamental to the universe. How? Yeah. How, how, how? Well, let's take a step back to the proposal and the evidence that mind and consciousness aren't what we have. Universal mind, cosmic consciousness is the foundation of reality. And we could go many hours into this. And I write, of course, in the cosmic hologram and the story of Gaia about this with the evidence. But how then does cosmic consciousness create a universal awareness of consciousness that then has the appearance of our beloved universe around us and us. It does so as in a language. It does so in a language, but that language isn't English. It's a digital language made up of just two letters of an alphabet, ones and zeros. And we know from all the evidence that we have at cosmological scales right down that that language is expressed as the energy, matter and space time appearance of our universe. And it does so from the most minute scale, as small as to an atom as an atom is to the whole universe. But at that minute scale, cosmic consciousness, universal consciousness rises, not just as the two letters of the alphabet, which is themselves don't have meaning, but combined as atoms, as molecules, as stars, as planets, as plants, as people, just as our digital technologies. You know, you and I are able to have this conversation because the image of me has been translated into long strings of ones and zeros, scooted down wires and off satellites and all the rest of it to your computer where it's retranslated from ones and zeros into my image and my voice, vice versa. Think of our whole universe doing this. Our so whole it, universe. That would say that our belief in separateness, our belief in polarization is erroneous at the very basic level. It is erroneous. Reality is real. And reality, the appearance of our universe, its reality emerges from these deeper levels of causation as the meaningful information that I describe, because every atom is innately meaningful. Every leaf on every tree, every person, everything in existence is innately meaningful and purposeful. Our universe exists meaningfully to evolve purposefully. So yes, absolutely, we are inseparable. And yet, the unity of our universe, its wholeness, is expressed in this radical diversity. So that kind of takes us back to when uh, we were talking about, was the past a mistake? Did we just mess things up? Well, if you've already arrived, you can't evolve, can you? No, it's a journey, isn't it? And yeah. our universe's journey, and so our evolutionary journey, 
began 13.8 billion years ago in its smallest and most simplest of, of states. And yet everything there, rather like a baby, a baby universe, everything there in its relational uh, laws of physics, in the way it was, in its meaningful information, able then to evolve from simplicity to complexity. So every step on that way is of itself meaningful and purposeful. And I would suggest, as I think you're suggesting, that the journey we've made to now is the journey we've made to now. And we've learned so much and it's cost us so much. So now is the time, it seems to me, for us to heal this dis-ease of separation. Have we gone from simplicity into great complexity and yet are destined to move into yet a more simple way of being? Yeah, because we've actually moved into complication <laughs> rather than complexity. There's that. <laughs> the, universe, the universe is complex. <laughs> Human behaviors are very complicated. <laughs> And yes, and, and what's really lovely is that every step on that journey, that universal journey to here and now, every step into greater complexity has involved cooperation. It's involved collaboration. It's not involved other than healthy competition. It's not being able to progress without that willingness and that ability and that intelligence that's absolutely embodied within it to cooperate at greater levels of, of complexity. And again, that's our choice now. And we've been sort of, we're trying to do it, but we've been trying to do it from a worldview of separation. But we turn around and realize that, you know, we're not in any way separate. I think it's going to make it much easier. Much easier. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're about out of time in this segment, but... How, you know, it seems to me like what you're saying makes such perfect sense because you can't participate if you can't compromise and blend. Absolutely. And you can't solve a problem from the same level of understanding that created it. <laughs> there is that, yes. <laughs> so I think it's the both, a both, I think it's the both and, and, and we're at such an amazing threshold of potential and possibility, yeah. it seems to me. It is exciting. It's a wonderful time to be alive, even with all the trials and tribulations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it is that magic moment for a station break. Please stay with us as Jude and I continue to explore the evolution of consciousness. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. <laughs> Do you have a product or service you'd like to promote to a worldwide audience? Imagine your product featured on Mission Evolution Radio TV. If you're interested in showcasing your work, Mission Evolution is broadcast to the Exxon TV Channel 32, Simul TV, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible, and many other audio and social media platforms. Our professional studios can produce and broadcast your custom high-quality ad. It will be permanently embedded in each episode and featured in the archives for years to come. Together, we can make it happen. Contact us at info at missionevolution.org for more details. Spaces are limited, so don't miss out on this great opportunity. Email info at missionevolution.org today. What choices do we have? This is Mission <laughs> Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're continuing our discussion with Dr. Jude Curvin. Her website, wholeworld-view.org. Jude, is evolution a given or is a certain amount of participation needed? Oh, I think participation, Gwilda. I, uh, every, um, when I was writing the story of Gaia, I, I love the stories of participation. You know whether it was it was it was the evolution of of um, nucleated cells, 
which requires symbiosis and, and bacteria working with together and whether it was slime molds and how they, you know, how they found their food and cooperate, whether it was the altruism that I was finding through so, so many stories. But absolutely, it, you know, evolution is participatory. And that leads us back to choices, doesn't it? It does indeed. You know, we not only choose to participate, but how we participate is a choice as well. It is. And 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 that's one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier at Whole World View, we talk about acting local, feeling global, and thinking cosmic, because different I think it's really important that at least on a sort of a, a, a an accessible, easy level for folks just to understand that we are inseparable. You know, just even if people have to take it on trust. Um, I, I was going to say, trust me, I'm a doctor, but I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's why I brought so much of the evidence together, because the evidence is so compelling. And it, it absolutely converges with universal wisdom teachings and spirituality based teachings. So there's a foundation there. There's an underpinning and a framing there that is cosmic. But that vast cosmos, the big, I talk about the big breath of our cosmos, you know, not beginning in a big bang. It was tiny, but it wasn't the chaos of a bang. It was the most incredible first moment of an ongoing, ordered, exquisitely fine-tuned big breath. That big breath of our universe breathes through us in every moment, in our little breaths. So even when we breathe, if we can have a sense of breathing that big breath, of a living and loving universe through us. When we breathe out, breathe out love. Breathe out love, as simple as that. So all our choices can, you know, we can make them complicated, we can make them complex. But if we take that thinking cosmic and that vastness and bring it into the intimacy of our lived experience, and then we act local in our communities and we feel global knowing the things we can do that can help the environment when we come, personal choices, but when we come together, I'm doing a huge amount of work now, bringing this unitive understanding into economics and education and folks who are doing wonderful work with the environment, but they too are saying, thank goodness, now we've got an underpinning and a framing. This unitive understanding sort of empowers us. So what do you feel uh, or you see as evidence that our universe meaningfully exists to purposefully evolve? Well, first of all, we need to go back to the very beginning. And that's 13.8 billion years ago. And at that moment, at those first few moments, the only energy matter or matter were, were beginning of um, atoms of helium and hydrogen, the simplest of atoms. You then go forward a couple of hundred years, a couple of hundred million years, and you come to stars and generations of stars living and transmuting those simple elements into ever more complex elements and then dying and exploding and, and releasing all those element, elemental nutrients into the interstellar medium of galaxies and then go forward you know, to about nine billion years ago before our sun was formed, before our planets were formed, our planetary home was formed, we now know that when we look out into space, we see interstellar clouds of molecular hydrogen. But it's not just molecular hydrogen. We've now discovered all the prebiotic building blocks of biological life out in space. In that deep, deep cold of space, these are... These are our wombs, these are gestations, these are nests, literally, for planetary systems. So when we look out there, we see everything that couldn't go beyond that level of complexity because it needed planets and water plants. But we see out there vast amounts of ice, vast amounts of these prebiotic nutrients, building blocks of RNA and DNA and protons, amino acids and protons and lipids and sugars. They're there. They're all there. And they're bathed by ultraviolet light from nearby stars. Not too powerful, but enough to keep them in a way that they're like chemical factories. You know, they're like emergent evolutionary factories. And then about five billion years ago, 
a large star came to the end of its life and exploded as supernova. And its shockwaves collapsed a portion of such a cloud, not chaotically, but it collapsed it in a way that it formed our planetary system with a proto-sun at the, the center. And instead of chaotic orbits for all the rest of the material around it, they were harmonic orbits, resonant orbits, able then to form planets. Our planet is the perfect distance from our star, the sun, in the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold, and a water planet. When Gaia was formed, all those prebiotic nutrients that had been part of that interstellar cloud were the birthing gifts to her. And that enabled her then to birth her biological children. And for the last four billion years, our journey, their journey, her journey has continued to this point. That is what I mean by meaning and purpose. So we truly are just bits of stardust. We're, we're even older. We're even <laughs> older than that. The, the hydrogen, the hydrogen in the water of our bodies is only a few minutes younger than our entire universe. The hydrogen in our bodies is nearly 13.8 billion years old. And the oxygen then was created in stars. So the water within us and everything else, you're right, is stardust. But the hydrogen goes back to the beginning. That's, that's amazing. That's just amazing. So um, were you able to hear my question, Jude? No, my dear, you froze. I was afraid of that, the statue. I said, is the time in the show when I get to ask you, what's your mission? Oh, my Lord. I, I, I don't think I have a mission. I, I think each of us is a mission. Each and every one of us is a mission of our universe to come into this earth walk and to experience and to learn. And I hope to find love and joy. But rather than having a mission, I think the very nature of our living, loving, evolutionary universe is that everything in existence is its profound mission. And there's purpose behind everything, isn't there? Yes. If, if there's anything this hour has focused on in a certain way, even though it hasn't been said, is, is this underlying consciousness and purpose. Where did it come from? For me, it goes back to, again, universal wisdom teachings that the nature of reality is mind and consciousness, cosmic consciousness. Some would call it the, the ground of all being. Um, others, great mystery or God or Allah or many other terms. But, you know, for me, if you ask where is God or where is great mystery, I would say everywhere, every when. There is nothing that is not so what do you see as the results of our upcoming collective choice? <laughs> That's the biggest question of the lot. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I suspect that neither you nor I would be here if we weren't optimistic. And I think realistically optimistic, um, because I think I, I see so much that is converging now. And I mentioned earlier, it's not despite all the metacrisis challenges we face, it's because of them. Because otherwise, in, in easy times, and again, you know, when you look at the, the evolutionary journey of the whole universe and our planetary home, it progresses through challenge. It always progresses through challenge. In times of ease, nothing much happens, to be honest. In times of change, some things do, but in times of great change, it's truly extraordinary how rapid evolutionary progress can be and we're at a point now where it's not so much biological evolution but conscious evolution in closing we're about out of time believe it or not but in closing what message of hope do you have to offer our worldwide audience i wrote a book once called hope <laughs> he healing h our o people and earth 
And in that book, I spoke about hope being foundational. It's not aspirational. It's a profound spark within us. And it seems to me that we have what we need to wake up, to remember, to come together, to love each other, to be humankind. And we need to choose it. Hmm. Beautifully put. Jude, as always, when we have you on the show, time flies. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Gwilda. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Our guest this hour has been Dr. Jude Curvin. Dr. Curvin holds a master's degree in physics and is the author of The Cosmic Hologram and The Story of Gaia. To find out more about Jude, where you can find her books and all she has to offer, visit her website, wholeworld-view.org. This has been Mission Evolution with Quilda Vieca. For more information or to enjoy our past archives, visit www.missionevolution.org. But please, be sure to join us right here next time. This mission will continue, bringing information, resources, and support to our evolving world. <laughs>